Hey, our next speaker is uh, Sanskar, and he will um, present Robin, an async framework written in Rust. Yes. So, hi, everyone. Before I present this talk, there's one task that I want you folks to do. It's a very specific task, and I'll tell you the explanation afterwards. So you folks need to give me your goofiest smile for exactly 17 seconds. Like, turn to your neighbors, smile as hard as you can. So, and the time starts now. Smile, smile as hard as you can. <laughs> and four, three, two, one. So now I'll tell you the reason why I did that, because it's very late in the day, and every one of us is now manifesting a very beautiful evening in Basel. So just like to get our attentions back on this. And also, I needed some time to settle in. So this was to calm my nerves as well. <laughs> and the number 17 was something that, that I just came out randomly. So most importantly, we've got some Robin stickers here. So if you folks are interested, feel free to get them after the talk ends. Now, about me, uh, my name is Sanskar. And in the mornings, I work at Bloomberg as a software engineer by, where I help create internal tools for bond trading. And in the evenings, I work on an open source project called Robin. Now, speaking of Robin, what is Robin actually? To put simply, Robin is a fast async Python web framework with a Rust runtime. So let's have a look at the current state of Robin. It's hosted on GitHub. It has a BSD 2.0 clause. It has around 1,400 stars on GitHub, 270k installs on PyPI. But most importantly, it's under active development. Now. Another web framework, you folks will definitely have had this question. Why another framework? What helps Robin stand out? So these are some of the key features. One, it's under active development. The second most important feature actually is that it's not written in just another language. It is written in Rust, by the way. It has a multi-threaded runtime. It's very extensible and has a very simple API. What it means is that if you have previous experience with Flask, Django, FastAPI, then there's almost no learning curve involved in it. It is very fast, so it can serve like 10,000 requests in 0.692 seconds. So this metric is not an absolute. It was on my own local machine, which is a very old MacBook, a dual core MacBook. So probably higher core machines will serve a lot higher requests. It supports async. It has uh, directly serving, multi-threaded, file serving, dynamic URL routing, middleware, web sockets. There's one feature which I developed like a day before coming here. It's still under development, but it's too cool to not show off. It's called constant request. And but most importantly, it's community first and truly open source. And it's so open source that if you know me from before, or if you have followed me somewhere, you know that I am not a big fan of types, type systems. So, but it's so community open source that the community was asking for type systems. So what community asks is what community shall get. <laughs> now, the, here comes the juicy part, the Robin story. Uh, why I invested this time on creating another web framework. So it was April of 2021, and I was in the final year of my university. And it was the COVID time, so everything was remote. And since I was a very hardworking student, and my final year thesis was approaching, I was spending all my time scrolling Reddit. <laughs> so during that time, a very famous company introduced Rust in their code base. And Reddit was filled with this meme, rewrite everything in Rust. And since I was also a very, very hardworking student, I was working on a completely unrelated project called Encrypt Text. And it had a Flask backend. And I had been writing Python for the past five years at this point of time. But also, I, I used to do a lot of front end. So I used to front end and back end in JavaScript. So I used to write a lot of Node.js, React. And one thing that bothered me about Flask was that it didn't have any async support. 
Uh, I had heard about Quart and Fast API, but since they were not very mainstream, so I thought, let's give it a go. You know, so I told myself, uh, you know, Sanskar, what would be cool uh, if we could have a Flask that could support async? And you know, what would be cooler if it would be written in Rust, by the way? So inspired from it. <laughs> so, and then I also uh, saw that the Ryan Dahl, who was the creator of Node.js, um, wrote Dino in Rust. So it may not be a bad language after all. So let's give it a go. So this, this is how basically Robin was born. But the most important question of this talk, why the name Robin? So if let's say I take care after a person named, after someone named Robin, if I help it grow, that would automatically make me Batman. So, so I'm a very big DC fan. So if I'm not replying on your Twitter messages or get get the messages anywhere. Just have a bad signal beside you, and I'll respond to you very quickly. <laughs> now, coming to the technical aspect of this talk, what is a traditional Python web app lifecycle? Usually, we have a reverse proxy in front of us in the in the frontmost part. Then we have a web server, which is a WSGI or an ASGI, and then we have a web framework like Flask, Django, FastAPI, and so on. So uh, let's have a look at the web framework part first. This is how a Flask app looks. Uh, in the audience, how many people are aware of how to write a Flask application? Okay, perfect. So this is how a Flask application looks. You import a class from the Flask module, you initialize it, then you create some decorators for the route. But I like Flask a lot. And, uh, that's why the Robin API looks very similar to it. Uh, and I have mod moderated some changes. For example, it's not app.route, but app.get instead of a route. But I believe that the API is very nice. And that's why we, I have incorporated a very similar API so that the learning curve is also not very deep. Uh, so this is how a Robin API looks. You import a Robin class, you initialize the application, and then you create the decorators for the route. Now let's have a look at the web server part of it. How many folks are aware what a WSGI or an ASGI is in the audience? Okay. So basically, uh, this is the code snippet of a WSGI, which stands for uh, Web Server Gateway Interface. This, the story behind the existence of web servers was that during, I think, 10 or 20 years back, there were like various web frameworks like Twisted, Quixote, and other web frameworks, but there was no standard way of actually serving them. So the PEP333 documentation, if you would like to read more about WSGI, they decided to create a unique interface where you would have just one callable in your application. So you could focus on the routing and the WSGI would ha handle all the dirty tasks for you. For example, HTTP validation, WebSocket validation, and so on. And ASGI is similar to it. It's a little harder to explain in a single slide, but it also follows a single callable or two callables, and then letting the ASGI handle the dirty parts for you so that you can focus on the routing. Even though a WSGI is very nice or an ASGI is very nice, uh, Robin doesn't support an ASGI and nor does it require to do so. And this is one of the reasons why Robin is faster than all other compared frameworks. So this would be a traditional deployment cycle of a Robin app. You just need a reverse proxy like Nginx or Caddy, and Robin ships with a coupled web server and a web framework. So a simple line of, let's say, Python 3 app.py would be the one, uh, would be the way how you run a uh, Robin app. So let's have a look at the architecture of the, uh, on how it is actually such, so much faster than the other frameworks. So this is the architecture. Let's have a look at the worker event cycle. So this is the first part that basically sends all the Python code and manages the Rust runtime. It creates the multi-threaded Rust runtime, which is the largest rectangle here. And then it spawns some requests. Now, when you start your application, let's say Python app.py, we have a thread safe router. That is populated by the Python objects. So these Python objects are converted to the Rust objects in a separate thread. 
and then the thread safe router is populated. Now, when the request comes from the worker event cycle, it is mapped to the routers and the thread pool is deployed and the tasks are put in the thread pool. So the Python code is executed. So this is the uh, way Python code is executed here. This is the thread safe router and this is the worker event cycle, which basically pipes the request towards the router. And finally, when the uh, work is done, the response is returned back to the worker event cycle and the response is sent back to the user or the client. Now to scale it further, uh, Robin not only supports multiple workers, so these threads uh, in the pools can be called as workers, which is the traditional lingo in the Python community. To scale across multiple cores, uh, so Robin also supports multiple processes. So now the TCP socket, which is used to uh, listen to a web request, is uh, shared across multiple processes. So it can be scaled across multiple cores of your machine in a better way. Now, this is one request that actually uh, helped me uh, make Robin much faster. It's still under development and the PR is still open, but it was too cool to uh, not tell the world right now. So as you can see, the encircled part, it is very GIL dependent. So what I mean by GIL is the global interpreter lock in Python. How many of you folks are aware of it? Perfect. So the GIL is notorious for uh, locking the threads in Python and not providing like a true multi-threaded experience. So it is basically, it is the, one of the main reasons where your Python multi-threaded co code doesn't feel truly multi-threaded. So it slows down some, some part of your code. Um, so this feature was suggested by someone in the community called Jack Thompson. Thank you, Jack. He said, what would be, it would be helpful if we execute uh, simple functions only once and eliminate the gill altogether. So the architecture would look like this. As you can see, the to and fro on every request has been eliminated and the gill has been bypassed for some of the responses. So that means the code is directly being served from the dust and neither gill lock has been acquired nor released. So that saves us a lot of overhead. So how that works is that if you can see, these are a few functions that return hello world. These are basically different ways of returning a constant string and maybe combining a constant string with a global variable. So looking at in the assembly code, that's what I found out that before a return value, most of them are just loading a constant. This means that the ro uh, Robin can basically, uh, while adding it to the router, so in this population task, we can see um, the assembly code of it and optimize it in such a way that it doesn't even need to be in, a, in the same router. A separate router exists for constant requests and it is opt automatically optimized. So like simple tasks, like serving a simple JSON file, serving simple data sets, serving simple strings can be optimized and uh, will be much, much faster than what regularly exists. Now let's have a look at the installation. The installation is fairly simple. You can just use a pip install or you can, if you use Conda, since many of us use GeoData so, or ML data, so you can use Conda for it to install Robin. Now to get you folks excited, I have a little feature showcase for it. So Robin also supports synchronous functions because many people believe that async model is just a mental model and they, it doesn't provide much benefit at, to the community or to the library. But let's not go into that, but that's one of the reasons why some of the libraries do not provide async methods. So it was, a must for Robin to support synchronous functions. It also uh, supports asynchronous functions because it was the core reason behind me creating Robin and not settling for Flask and other frameworks. And as I told you, I was a React and a front-end developer and I almost found it very hard to integrate Python and JavaScript together. Um, even if there exist many ways, there isn't a very clear documentation. So you, 
that's why I added a very simple add directory method where you would just build your React application, add a route, add a directory path, and serve and point to the index file, and that's pretty much it. So you can add it on the entire routes, you can add it on sub routes. Uh, the flexibility is up to you. And this is the static file serving. So this uh, file serving is much faster from any other framework because it uses like a multi threaded file serving from the Rust uh, Tokyo runtime. So it, it doesn't need to go to the Python code to serve you the file content, it will directly serve you from a lower level. So Gil is not acquired or released. So the file serving here is much faster. Then we have URL routing so that you can have variable parameters inside your URLs. You just need to add a colon and you have a request object that's exposed to you. So you can access it, access the parameters and return the uh, whatever you want to do with it basically. Now you can do, since Robin was supposed to be scalable, I tried to make it uh, as, config, as configurable from the code base as well as the command line. So you can pass the number of processes and the workers in the code base as well as the CLI. So you don't need to worry about having an external config file. Uh, and this is one of the features that I really like about the JavaScript ecosystem is the middlewares. So you can have these two decorators to have like per route middlewares. Global middlewares are still in uh, development, but for the moment you can have a, like a middleware for every route. So you can have logging, database, queries, basically your creativity is your limit now. And WebSockets. So this was a very fun feature to implement. Uh, Robin supports WebSockets. So, and that's, that comes in by default. You don't have to install any plugin or anything. You just exp, uh, import a WebSocket class, initialize it, and you have a WebSocket. We have three methods, which are connect, close, and message. So the message method returns you a message on every, uh, basically, every ping a WebSocket gets. And then there's this connect and close, which are basically the event handlers of uh, Robin, uh, of a WebSocket route, yeah. And finally, const request. So right now, constant request optimization or const request are only supported through an annotation. Uh, the For automatic optimization, the PR is still open. So hopefully, it should be released in 0 0 0.17.1 or 0.17.0. We'll see. And there are many more features. So you can check out at the repo if you are. But if you are already not excited, I have a performance comparison for you folks. So we have a performance comparison of Flask, FastAPI, Django, Robin, and Robin Experimental. But before we compare, there's a PSA that this comparison is not to demean any framework. These frameworks were the ones that actually inspired me and got me into programming. And I'm very grateful for these frameworks to exist. But now coming to the comparison. Uh, Flask was used with GUnicorn, Fast API was used with Ubicon, Django with GUnicorn again. And all of these were given like five threads as recommended on the websites. So Flask took around five seconds. Fast API was a little faster than Flask, which took uh, four seconds. Django was the slowest for some reason, around 13 seconds. Now Robin, which is which doesn't have a double asterisk, was running only on a single worker thread. So it was uh, still faster than all of the compared frameworks. But Robin on the rightmost side was running on five worker threads and the, using the constant request optimization. So as you can see, it just took like 0.69 seconds to serve 10,000 requests. So yeah, I think that's pretty fast. And now coming to the future roadmap, what I plan to integrate in the future for Robin is add more speed optimizations uh, for sure. Add some open API integration because I know that that's a feature that's very well uh, liked by the community. Add pydantic support because people love types. <laughs> and add constant request uh, optimization, finalize and release it to the community. And uh, add ORM support, especially Prisma. I am really liking the Prisma ORM right now. So I'd 
create a plugin that allows you to easily access the database with it, improve the plugin ecosystem, um, improve the documentation web sockets. Add template support, which was recently asked by me, asked by someone to me. Add like Jinja and other template support. Uh, but most importantly, I would try to increase the community involvement because most open source projects are only successful if you folks, if the project has a very strong community involvement. So here are a few important links for Robin. Uh, we have a GitHub community. The PyPI project is basically Robin. The website is robin.tech. The docs link is present here. And you should definitely join the Jitter community. Most of us are fairly active there. So if you have any query, it should be resolved within like two or three hours. At least we'll try to resolve it in two to, two, two to three hours. Special thanks to the uh, sponsors and the contributors of the code base. Um, it wouldn't be possible without you folks. Um, and yeah, that's it. P.S. We are hiring at Bloomberg. So if anyone's interested, feel free to talk to me. Star Robin on GitHub and you can ask me any questions that you have. Thank you. That is fantastic stuff, and I will definitely check it out. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. Great work. Looks really, really awesome. Um, I would like to know um, which kind of, which flavor of async uh, can I use in async functions? Is it just the usual async IO derived uh, functionality that I have, or is it something, something else? Um, it also uses like UV loop under the hood for Linux and Mac OS. Mm -hmm. So that makes the runtime a little faster, but you can use the regular async IO. Almost every type of asynchronous code will be compatible to uh, with Robin. Um, have you looked at uh, comparing it to non-Python uh, similar frameworks like Spring or other uh, ones? Do you mean like Go and REST frameworks? Yes, to see if it's almost similar performance. I, I did try to compare it with Actix, which is a REST native framework, but they were much faster. Like the lower level frameworks are much faster than any Python framework. But I was trying to make it as fast as a Python framework can be possible since it's on a rust runtime. So I believe there will be some overhead over it. So it will definitely not be as fast as a rust native framework, but I'm trying to like optimize it as much as possible. Um, in that connection, I uh, encourage you to look at the tech and power uh, benchmarks for web frameworks. That's a cross platform, cross language. Yes. The, so the PR is open for tech empowered. So cool. if, if you folks are uh, like connection, connected with them, please get them merged. Cool. Uh, my question was if you know if there's any uh, plugin or middleware implementation of uh, OAuth already? Uh, not, not by me, but I was looking on um, the projects that are using right now and I saw someone you write a JWT implementation, but uh, I haven't had a very deep dive into it. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, then thanks again. Perfect. Thank you so much. Also, the swags are up for grabs. Anyway.